on Friday night and continued all day yesterday and will conclude today. And there have been some outstanding lessons and those that uh, were here for those I know have benefited from them and you will benefit I know from these lessons that you'll hear today. At this hour, uh, we are pleased to have Brother Kevin Kane with us, and he's going to be speaking on the subject, Transformed by Love. And uh, Kevin is a 1992 graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching, and uh, I think you came into the class right after I graduated, so I left, he came in, and uh, tried to clean up that mess, uh, but that made him tougher. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? And uh, Kevin has done great work uh, since graduating from the school. Uh, he has done a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching. Uh, sometime, I don't remember how many years after that, he went to law school uh, in the Houston area and is now an attorney uh, there in Houston. Uh, his uh, Wife Sheila is with us today, otherwise known as His Saving Grace, and uh, their two children, Peyton and Megan, are also here, and we're glad that they're here with us. Uh, Kevin is also a, a part of uh, our Camp uh, Bandina session that some of our young people and uh, adults uh, go to every year, every summer, and he is, uh, works with our education part and, and teaches and preaches as well, and so uh, uh, we're glad that he does that, uh, very, very beneficial in that uh, realm as well. So we're glad that he's here, and we look forward to his lesson during our Bible class hour. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and then we'll turn it over to Kevin. Gracious Father, thank you for the night of rest that we have enjoyed. We're thankful for this new day, thankful for opportunities to study together. We pray your blessing uh, on our brother Kevin as he speaks to us this morning. We pray that uh, as he opens up the word and, and uh, proclaims it, that our hearts would be open to the message and that we would find uh, lessons that we can use and uh, that we can use to help mold us more and more into the image of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. <clears throat> there's a young boy who's about five years old and he decides he wants to make his mother a breakfast and he's seen mom make breakfast and so he's he's seen her make pancakes and that's what he wants to do he's not really sure how to do it but he's got a general idea so he gets out some eggs and milk and some flour and sugar and he starts in the kitchen and he gets out a big bowl and he puts some flour in the bowl some flour gets in the bowl some's on the counter some's on the floor he puts some sugar in the bowl. He puts a lot of sugar in the bowl because he likes sugar. And again, some gets in the bowl, some other places all around. Uh, he then gets the milk out and the carton's full and he kind of struggles with it and he spills about half of it into the bowl and about half of it onto the counter and he realizes he's really making a mess. And then while he tries to clean up that mess that he's making, he knocks the eggs off onto the floor and he starts to get really frustrated because he's really making a huge mess of things. And as he's getting frustrated, he looks up and he, <clears throat> he looks across the kitchen and he sees his dad watching him. And then he gets a little embarrassed and he starts to cry. And his dad comes over and he says, son, what do you say I help you clean this mess up? And do you think that you and I could work together and make your mom a really good pancake breakfast? And the little boy says, Dad, that sounds great, because I think if, if you and I work together on something, I don't think there's anything that we can't do. I think our lives can be a lot like that story. We can have really good intentions. We can have really great dreams of what we think our life is going to be like, what life will be like. And then before long, we realize we have just made a royal mess of everything. And we don't know what to do. And we can't fix it ourselves. But we have a loving father 
who patiently can work with us and help us, and he can turn a mess into a masterpiece. I want to talk this morning about being transformed and changed by love. And I want to start by talking about the messed up church in Corinth. They had a lot of problems. I mean, they were a messed up church. In chapter 1, They've got preacheritis that's dividing the church. They've got their favorite preachers. In chapter 5, they've got immorality in the church at Corinth that is unnamed even amongst the Gentiles. Chapter 6, they're taking each other to court and suing each other. Chapter 8, they're eating meat that's sacrificed to idols and it's offending the weaker brethren. In chapter 11, they are, they are abusing misusing the Lord's Supper for what it was divinely intended to be. And then in chapters 12 and 14, they are misusing spiritual gifts when they come together to worship in their worship assembly. I mean, this this is a messed up church. They have made a royal mess of things. But yet in the middle of all this, in the midst of this messed up church, you've got chapter 13. You've got the chapter of love. Love is the solution to the problems that the church had in Corinth. Love is the solution to the way that we've messed up our lives and the problems that we face and encounter. When we want to try and get things right in our lives, I think one of the first things we need to do is ask ourselves, am I loving like the Bible describes love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Turn your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 13. That'll be our text today as we talk about love. There's no better place to go in the Bible than 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Our outline is here in this chapter. In verses 1 through 3, we've got the motive for love. In verses 4 through 7, you have the description of love. And in verses 8 through 13, you've got the permanency of love. And so let's jump right in and let's talk about the motive of love. Verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noising gong or a clanging cymbal. What you see here is that active worship is not a replacement for love. I can do all kinds of things and come together in the worship assembly. I can use my gifts. I can lead. I can teach. I can lead singing. I can lead prayers. I can do all kinds of wonderful things in my worship, but without love, I'm just a noisy nothing. In verse 2, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. We see here in this verse that superior faith and knowledge is not a replacement for love. You know, faith that could remove mountains. That's great faith. You know, I could really, wouldn't it be neat if I could just at any time answer any Bible question that anyone ever had? Or if just at the the drop of a hat, I could just stand up and without preparing or studying, I could just preach a soul-stirring, wonderful gospel sermon. And people would say, boy, that's a, th- th- that person has all kinds of talents. They're really good at what they do. That's a great Christian. And yet Paul would say, but without love, I am nothing. And then in verse 3, if I give away all I have, and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Here we see that supreme personal sacrifice is not a replacement for love. Imagine what the brethren would say if they found out that I gave everything I owned, every penny I have, I gave it to the church. What would they say about me? Surely it'd be good things, wouldn't it? Or what if I had made the supreme personal sacrifice? What if I died for the cause of Christ because of my faith, I gave up my life? Isn't that a go directly to heaven card? And yet Paul says, but if you did all those wonderful things without love, you gain nothing. And the point here is really simple in verses 1 through 3. Everything you do, every wonderful thing you do is meaningless if you don't have the motive of love coupled with it. 
We have to be loving. Now let's talk about the description of love. Let's talk about the 15 verbs that Paul uses to describe what love is in verses 3 through 7. It is so easy for the world to misunderstand love. I think this is one of the concepts in the Bible that's probably more misunderstood than any. The world has its own version of what they think love is. They misunderstand it. There's a, uh, two families in West Virginia that hated each other. They feuded with one another. That's how you do things in West Virginia, apparently. And they, for generations, in fact, they'd been going on so long, this feud had been going on so long, they didn't even know why they were fighting. They just did. And so every morning, Jethro would wake up on one side of the river, and he'd see Clarence on the other side, and he'd yell over at him and say, <clears throat> Clarence, if it weren't for this river right here, I'd come over there, I'd clean your clock, I'd teach you a thing or two, I'd do this and I'd do that. And he'd yell back at him, and Clarence would yell the same thing back. If it weren't for this river, I'd come over there and I'd do this. And they did that every single morning. And then one year, the county came along, and 100 yards or so on down the river, they built a bridge. And Jethro and Clarence just pretended like it wasn't there. And they'd still get up every morning. Boy, if it weren't for this river right here, I'd come over there and every morning. And one morning Jethro gets out and he starts yelling at Clarence. And Jethro's wife comes out and she says, just hush. I am tired of hearing it. Either you go over there and do something about it or just be quiet. Well, she hurt Jethro's feelings. So Jethro felt like he kind of had to do something about it now. So Jethro's wife goes inside, and Jethro hangs his head, and he starts to walk down toward the bridge. About five minutes later, Jethro bursts into the house with this look of terror on his face. <clears throat> he runs to the back of the house and runs into his bedroom, and Jethro's wife has no idea what's going on. She goes back in the bedroom, and she can't find Jethro. <clears throat> she looks all around, and she finally finds him curled up underneath the bed, with that same look of terror on his face, and she says, <clears throat> honey, what's going on? And Jethro says, I had no idea how big he was. And she said, what are you talking about? I've seen Clarence before. He's no bigger than you are. And he said, "Nuh uh I walked down toward that bridge, and as I started to cross over, I looked up there, and I saw a big sign that said, Clarence, 13 feet, 6 inches. You see, it's real easy to misunderstand. It's real easy for the world to think about just the general concept of love and think they know what the Bible's talking about. But Paul makes it just as simple and clear. It's so simple that even I can understand it. Let's talk about the description of what love is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, or some translations say, love suffers long. That's literally what that word means. Now, I don't think, by the way, it's a coincidence that patience is the first thing that's mentioned. I think it's the first thing that's mentioned because this is really getting to the heart of what love is. Love is patience. It's patient. It literally means to suffer long, to suffer for a long period of time without retaliation. That's what love is. Now, we understand that, and so I have to ask this question. Where is your tipping point? Where is the point when you say, okay, I know I'm supposed to love, but not if they do this. I know I'm supposed to love, but, you know, do you know what they did to me? Do you know how they treated me and how they hurt my family, my children? Do you know what they did? Uh-uh. I'll love, but not if they do that. And God's response to that is, you know what you need to do when they do that? You need to keep on loving them because love suffers long. Love is kind. Now, in not every translation, but in most translations, that word kind is preceded by the conjunction and. And I think that that's important. 
Because it's not just kindness in general, just a general idea or thought of just generally be good and kind and nice to people. It's giving us context and helping us understand kindness. What kind of kindness? We're talking about kindness in terms of how we treat other people who don't love us. Other people who cause us to suffer long. Love suffers long and is kind. That's what we're talking about. So don't, don't isolate kind all by itself. Jesus talked about this concept in Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 44 through 46, he said, But I say to you, love your enemies, those people who cause you to suffer long. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? You know, every once in a while <clears throat> on YouTube or somewhere on the, on, on the Internet, you'll see a little video of some little boy who goes to the zoo. <clears throat> and he's sitting there, and on one side of the glass, and on the other side is a monkey. And the little boy will, will touch the top of his head, and the monkey will touch the top of his head too. And the little boy will stick out his tongue, and the little monkey will stick out his tongue. And we have a phrase for that. It's called monkey see, monkey do. And some of us love like monkeys. I'll be nice to you if you're nice to me. I'll be kind to you if you treat me with kindness. And so, waiter, if you'll treat me with respect, and waiter, if you'll get my food order right, then I'll be nice and polite and kind to you. Wife, if you'll treat me with respect and get my order right, then I'll be nice to you and I'll be kind to you. And children, if you are kind to me, and an employee or employer, if you're nice to me and respectful to me, then I'll return the same. But if you don't, don't expect me to be nice in return. You know, sometimes we think to ourselves, if I don't unload on my enemy, I'm doing pretty good. And God would say, you're, you're, you're halfway there. But did you treat him with kindness? Did you bless those who curse you? Did you pray for those who persecute you? Or did you only suffer long? Because love does not just suffer long, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy or boast, love is not arrogant. In my favorite translation, it's called the King Cain translation, it says there, love does not parade itself. You ever seen a parade? I think we've all seen a parade. Have you ever seen someone who thinks they are the parade? because it's all about me, that's not love. That's just not love. Did you know that you can trace most sins in the Bible back to the concept of envy? For instance, why did Eve eat the fruit? Well, because she wanted to be as smart as God. And why did Cain kill his brother? Well, he was envious of the <clears throat> fact that God accepted Abel's sacrifice. And why did Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery? Because they, they were envious of the close relationship that, that Joseph had with his father. Even Jesus himself could not escape the stain and the ugliness of envy in his lifetime. In Matthew 27, verse 18, it says, For he, referring to Pilate, knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Envy, such an ugly, ugly sin. You know, there's this... There's this joke going around about this person who's suffering a, a terrible, terrible dilemma in their life. They don't know whether to tell you first that they're a vegetarian or a CrossFit athlete, and it's just tearing them up. And you're asking yourself, do I have a friend who's a vegetarian or a CrossFit athlete? If you ask that question, the answer is no. Because if you did, they would have already told you again and again and again and again. You know, we've all seen a parade, don't live one. Because true love doesn't parade itself, true love parades Christ. And that's what we need in our lives. In Romans 12, verse 16, it says, Live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, do not associate with the lowly. When I was a little kid, I memorized this verse in the King James, and I like the way the King James read at the very end there. It says, but condescend to men of low estate. 
That's very descriptive, but it's kind of odd language. And here's basically what it means. Whenever you walk into a room and there's other people in the room, you, you do, I think, what most people do. You'll kind of assess the situation and say, well, there's someone I want to talk to. There's someone I'd like to meet. There's someone I hope I never talk to. There's someone that I hope I never see in a dark alley. And you just kind of go through the room and you just kind of make that assessment. And what this verse is saying, those people that you don't want to talk to, those are the people you need to go talk to. The people that you think are not worthy of your time and your attention and your conversation, you need to condescend to men of low estate, people that you don't think are worthy of you. Go talk to them. That's what love compels us to do. Love is not rude. I don't know if the world understands what rude is anymore because it seems to have just gone rampant with rudeness. But rude is basically just treating people with behavior that you would not accept or tolerate for yourself. But it's good enough for them. There's a website called pairedlife.com and they came up with a list of 25 rudest rude behaviors. Now these are not a list of rude behaviors. These are a list of the rudest rude behaviors. And I just want to share with you some of the things that they came up from this survey, that they surveyed people and asked, what what do you think is rude? And here's some of the things they came up with. Cutting in lines, number 24. 21, not returning your shopping cart. How dare you? Number 18, cutting off others in traffic. 17, tailgating when you drive. Improper cell phone use. Personal grooming in public. If you've ever ridden on a bus, you understand what that one's all about. Number three, driving slow in the passing lane. Now, that should be a capital offense. I agree with that one. You know, Rude behavior, and everyone has their idea of what they think is rude, and the point here is just we need to be very careful in how we treat other people and making sure we're not treating them rudely because love Agape, godly love, is not rude. Love does not insist on its own way. And basically what that saying is, love is not self-centered. That's what that means. This this reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. Teenagers, do you know the answer to this? How many teenagers does it take to screw in a light bulb? You know? Well, you should. It's just one. The teenager holds up the light bulb and then the world just revolves around them to screw it in. (laughs) Now, if you're not a teenager, you might think that that's mildly amusing. But the reality is, teenagers, that you could take any person, any age, any demographic, And you could replace them in that joke for teenagers, and you would still be right. Because all too often, on too many occasions, we are a little too self-centered. And we're thinking about me. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable. It is not easily provoked. Not easily angered, some translations say. There's a little boy named Timmy, and he was filling up a pretty good-sized hole in his backyard with dirt. He's filling it in. His neighbor looks over the fence, and he says, Timmy, what are you doing there? And Timmy looks up, and he says, well, I'm, I'm burying my goldfish. And the neighbor says, well, Timmy, that's, that's an awful big hole for a goldfish. And Timmy says, well, that's because he's in your dumb old cat. See, unlike Timmy, love is not easily provoked or easily angered. That's just not love. Now, please, please, please do not say, well, my love, my my, my anger issues and and, and my losing control of my anger, that's just, that's kind of a, that's a genetic thing. My dad was like that and my granddad was like that and we're just, we're part Scottish and we just can't help it and so that's, that's just the way we are. Please do not blame your sin on your genetics. The world does that all the time. We should never do that. It is not a genetic thing. My anger and inability to control it is a love thing, not a genetic thing. 
James talked about this concept in James 1, verse 19. He said, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now notice right at the very end there, you've got the slow to anger part that we're talking about. But did you ever notice that the antidote to that is the preceding two thoughts? You want to get a hold of your anger? Then practice this. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. In other words, be quiet and listen. And that will help you in an amazing way to control your anger because someone who listens is someone who loves. Let me encourage you, elders and preachers, uh, let, let, let me encourage you to try this. Find someone in your congregation who's what I would describe as being overworked or underappreciated, which usually what that means is, you know, find someone who teaches a Bible class. And sit down with them and just ask them, you know, what, what, what are you struggling with? What, you know, what, 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 what do you need help with? What, what, what are your struggles? And, just, and then just sit there and just listen. And then when they get done, just say, well, here, here's what I'd like to do if this is okay with you. I'd like to pray for you and what you're struggling with every day for the next 30 days and see if that doesn't have an amazing impact on their life because you took the time to listen and you took the time to love because love is not easily angered or easily provoked and we won't have a problem with that if we're listening to one another. Love is not resentful. Now here's where a lot of translations will have a lot of different things. And there seems to be some translation issue here. And love is not resentful is really not a, a good translation of what Paul wrote here. The Greek word here is logizomai. Logizomai is the Greek word here. It's an accounting term. So Doug, you should like this. This is an accounting term. It literally means to keep a record. And the better translation is what they'll say is, love does not keep a record of wrongs. You know, sometimes you, know, you sin, you make a mistake, you fall, you stumble, and there's always someone there who said, oh, I knew it was just a matter of time. Boy, that's just typical of you. You've made that mistake before. I knew you were going to do it again. You remember when you did it the last time? Love doesn't do that. Love does not keep a record of wrongs and hold it over people's head and remind them of it. Some of you have probably heard the name Clara Barton before. Clara Barton was a Civil War nurse. She was also the founder of the American Red Cross. And when she was alive, there, there was an occasion where she was, she was working and one of her fellow nurses came up and said, you know, do you remember when you know, th this other person did something to you and it was, just, it was, such, it was such a terrible thing and they really hurt you and she said, no, I, I don't remember that. And she said, no, no, you, know, you remember. You know, this person did this and they did this. And it, it was just terrible. I can't believe the way they treated you. Don't you remember that? And she said, no, I don't remember that. And this person kept on and kept on until finally at one point Claire Barton finally said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. Because love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love does not logizomai. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. You know, there are too many times and occasions where something bad happens to someone and we say, well, they had that a coming. <laughs> Boy, they deserve that. It's about time. You know, we don't like it when bad things happen to good people, but when bad things happen to bad people, well, that's okay, right? But love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Love does not rejoice over bad things happening to other people, regardless of whether or not we subjectively think they deserve it or not. Obadiah talked about this principle in Obadiah 12. He was writing to the Edomites, and he was talking about what they did when they were standing over there and watching their half-brothers, the Jews, being taken into captivity. And he said, but do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast. In other words, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. In contrast, though, love does rejoice with the truth. 
you rejoice when good things happen, and I'm not talking about your favorite football team, your favorite uh, baseball team, the Rangers. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, spiritual good things that happen. Do you rejoice when souls are changed to be more like Christ? Do you rejoice when people come forward and they ask for prayers? Do you rejoice when we see our young people growing in their faith? You rejoice when souls are baptized into Christ, when people come to us and say they want to be a part of this congregation and they want to work and worship with us? Do we rejoice when someone stands in the pulpit and proclaims the truth? Do we go home at night and give thanks to God when we see good things happening? Because love rejoices with the truth. And love bears all things. And when I see that love bears all things, I can't help but think of Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What law are we talking about? The law of love. When we bear one another's burdens, we are showing our love for one another. But what is it that we can bear? What is it that we can help each other carry that will show our love for one another? How about things like we help each other bear our pain and suffering, our loneliness, our loss and heartache. We bear each other's shame and help each other bear sin. We help each other with feelings of worthlessness and inadequacy and heartache. And when we help each other bear those burdens, we are saying to them, I love you. The kind of love that Paul's writing about here in verse 7 Love believes all things and love hopes all things, which is just another way of saying, I will assume and expect the best in others. In other words, when I hear bad news and someone did something wrong and terrible, I'm not just going to believe it just because someone's kind enough to gossip and spread rumors. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to expect the best because don't you want people to do that to you? Have you ever been on the receiving end of that where someone's out there spreading rumors and false stories about you? And that's heartbreaking enough. But then when you find out that people that you know, people that you love, your brothers and sisters in Christ are, are, are buying into that. And you're asking yourself, how can they, th how can they assume that? I mean, they know me. They know better, don't they? love me? Don't they assume the best? Don't they hope all things and believe all things? Because that's what love does. And finally, love endures all things. Endurance is just patience and practice. Notice, we start with the concept of patience and we end with the concept of patience in terms of what love is and what do all of these have in common. These 15 verbs, these descriptions of what love is, what they all have in common is they describe someone who is selfless, not selfish. That's what love is. That's what all those descriptions have in common. Someone who is selfless. Now let's talk about the permanency of love in verse 8. Verses 8 through 13, the permanency of love. Love never ends. In other words, it's not a light switch. It's not something you just turn on and off and I'll be loving to you if I like it today and not loving to you. If, if, it's, if we only love when it's convenient and easy, then it's not really love. There has to be a consistency. Our love must be consistent. And consistent in a positive way, meaning I will always love you because that's what God wants me to do and the kind of person God wants me to be. It has to be consistency there. Verse 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. But the greatest of these is love. Faith and hope, those are clearly important. The Bible has a lot to say about those subjects. And we're not trying to minimize those in any way. But the greatest of these is love. You remember Jesus emphasized and talked about this concept. Remember Matthew 23, he was asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? In verse 36, Jesus said, you know what? I'll tell you what is the first and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you know what? Here's a freebie. You didn't ask for it, but I'll give you this one. Here's the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, the greatest of these is love. 
Let me ask you to think about maybe some, some statements that you've heard or maybe have even said over the years, because I know I have. You ever hear someone say something like this? Just stay firm in the faith, and that's all that matters. Just be faithful. Okay, but what about 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2? Where Paul just said, I could have faith that removes mountains. I could have the greatest faith in the world. But if I don't have love, I am nothing. But the greatest of these is love. Or ever hear, hear someone say, our sole reason for being here this morning in our assembly is to worship God. Now please don't think that I'm here to minimize worship in any way. We're here this morning and we will be worshiping God and that is absolutely important. What's our text that we use over and over again when we say we're supposed to assemble, you're supposed to come together, Christians are supposed to assemble. Where do we always go to? Hebrews 10 verse 24 and verse 25, right? That's the verse that we use. And notice what it says. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Notice what it says. When you assemble and come together, here's what I want you to do. I want you to encourage one another. I want you to stir up one another to good works. I want you to stir up one another to love. That's why I want you to come together. Because there's something special and unique about our worship when we come together that's different from when I'm worshiping and praying to God at home, when I'm singing songs of praise in my car on the way to work, when I'm reading my Bible at home. There's something different about when we come together. We can do something unique here that I can't do when I'm at home, and that is to stir up one another to love and good works. So let me ask you to do this. At some point, you're going to leave this assembly. I know some of you like to stay later than others. I know the, the carols and the cocuses like to be the ones who turn off the lights, and I think they pay rent here. But at some point, you're going to leave, and you're going to get in your car, and when you get in your car, let me ask you to get into the habit of doing this, one thing. Before you turn on that engine, just ask yourself one question. Did I stir up anyone to love? If the answer is, I don't know or no, Please get out of your car, go back inside, and go love on someone. Because that's why we're supposed to assemble. We're supposed to encourage one another, to stir up one another, encourage each other to be more loving and to be more faithful and more active and working in the kingdom. That's what God wants us to do here. Because the greatest of these is love. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, I knew it. I knew it. I knew that preacher was wrong. I knew those elders were wrong. I knew it. I knew that all you have to do is just love, and that's all that matters. Just love, and all that little detail, minutia, little, you know, doctrine, and, and marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and salvation, and baptism, and, and all, all that specific stuff, instrumental music, that, that doesn't matter, because all you have to do is love, because the greatest of these is love. I knew I was right, and let me be as clear as I can be. My response to that is no, 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 no. And again, I say, no. Now, it's real easy to just say, and, 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 and this would be absolutely right, John 14, 15 answers that question. If you love me, you do what? You keep my commandments. See, it's real simple. Love does not mean I just get to have a warm feeling in my heart and think of warm, soft kitty cats and puppies, and everything's good, and then all the rest doesn't matter. If you love me, keep my commandments. But maybe here's a Maybe not a better way, but another way to look at this. Let's look at some verses real quickly that talk about just how important love is, how encompassing love is. 1 John 4, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So very important. 
In Galatians 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Notice the very first fruit that's mentioned out of all of them that are listed there is love. The grace of these is love. 1 Peter 4, verse 8, above all, meaning above everything, this is really important, the grace of these is love. Keep loving one another earnestly. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. How important that is, how eternally important love is. Now think of Matthew 23, verse 23 for just a second to help give us maybe a little perspective and balance here. As an example, where Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done. Now when he says these you ought to have done, what is the these that he's referring to? Well, that would be justice and mercy and faithfulness. And so, Jesus is saying, these things are more important. But that doesn't mean that's all you have to do, and the verse ends there, because it doesn't. He says, without neglecting the others, the others being tithing, mint, and dill, and cumin. Meaning, just because one thing may be more important than another thing doesn't mean I get to neglect it and say, I don't have to do that. Love is the greatest, and so I don't have to worry about all those other things. No, it's not an either-or proposition. It's a both-and proposition. You need to be loving. You need to be submitting yourself. You need to be a servant. You need to be obeying. You need to be doing what the Bible says, what I say you need to be doing. That's the godly perspective on love. Love is not a substitute for everything, and therefore I don't have to worship, and I don't have to work, and I don't have to serve, and I don't have to obey. It goes hand in hand with everything that we are doing as we serve humbly, as we work, as we obey, as we do what God wants us to do. There was a teacher who gave a little boy a math problem. She said, imagine your mom cooks your favorite pie. Everybody in your family gets a piece, and you, by the way, you've got seven people in your family, so what size piece of pie are you going to get? And the little boy says, one-sixth. And the teacher says, no, that's not right. Remember, there's seven people in your family. And the boy says, well, I understand that, but you don't know my mama, because my mom would never take a piece of pie for herself because she's always thinking of others. That's the kind of love that God wants us to have, a love that is focused not on what I want and not on what I need, but is focused on others. It's that agape, selfless, godly love that puts others first, that isn't concerned with me, and it's not all about me. It's about God it's about my neighbor, it's about my family, it's about everyone but me. That's the kind of love that God wants us to have. And if we'll let God clean up our messy lives, if we'll be more loving and have that kind of selfless love like Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, we will be transformed. We will be transformed to the point that we'll be like those people in John 13, verse 35, where our lives are so different that people will come up to us and say, there is something different about you. There is something so different about you. And they're going to notice this, not because we're right on what the doctrines of the Bible teach, although those are important. But they're not going to notice that because we worship scripturally, <clears throat> although that is important. They will notice that and they'll see that we were different and they're going to want to know what we're about because, Jesus said, you love one another. And they're going to see that in you and they're going to see something different. And then because of that, they're going to come to know what the truth is about all those other important topics, about baptism, how we live, how we treat one another, how we worship. And those are important things. And the way we get them there is they're going to look at us and they're going to see people who selflessly love one another because we've been transformed to be more and more like Christ. Transformed by love. Thank you so much for your attention this morning.